The reading today, if you've got your Bibles there at home or you'll see it come up on the screen, is John 16, 16 to 23. And it's the disciples' grief will turn to joy. Jesus went on to say, In a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me. At this, some of his disciples said to one another, What does he mean by saying, In a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? And because I'm going to the Father. They kept asking, what does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what he is saying. Jesus saw what they wanted to ask him about this. So he said to them, are you asking one another what I meant when I said, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? Very truly, I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come, but when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you, now is the time of your grief, but I will see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. So before we get into the sermon this morning, I just want to create a little moment of personal reflection. I want you to take a moment, perhaps close your eyes and block out the distractions that surround you. And I want you to consider, what three character traits describe you? I want you to be honest. Not necessarily the persona you share with others, but who are you at your core? Now let's widen our circle a little. What three character traits would you use to describe our church? And again, let's widen the circle just once more. What three character traits would you use to describe our community? I don't know about you, but this latest series, Resisting Tame, has challenged me to the core. It's got me really thinking about who I am and asking questions like, how do I live out my faith? How am I light and salt? How do my actions portray the power and wisdom of God's spirit within me? How do I follow Jesus in this time and place? Our series is based on verses in Revelation 3 where Jesus is speaking to the church of Laodicea. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you from my mouth. Pretty compelling scripture, right? And so far we've been encouraged to develop a number of disciplines which stand defiant to the pools of our modern day culture. That hunger must resist indifference. That sacrifice must resist privilege. That honour must resist contempt. And hospitality must resist apathy. It's been a powerfully compelling series. And I encourage you to visit our Bright Church of Christ website or Facebook page and watch any that you've missed. Today we're going to continue by exploring how celebration needs to resist cynicism. But before we do, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word and for the way in which it reveals your heart to your people. Father God, you are good and you want good for us. Help us to know and to trust that deep within our core. Help us to listen to the promptings of your spirit as you shape and equip us to be your people. Help us to follow Jesus, to be salt and light as we live out the convictions of our faith each and every day. This morning, Lord, I pray that your words are spoken, that your spirit ignite. May you spark in us, each one listening this morning, 
a fervent desire to resist the temptations of being tamed by the culture in which we live. Instead, Lord, may we reaffirm the convictions of our faith. Might we be filled with hope and power of your spirit and rest in joy and peace that only you give. Amen. Cynicism. You know, I think if we had to choose just one word that would describe our culture today, I think cynical would have to be right up there. There's no doubt that cynicism is woven deeply into the fabric of our Australian society. We're distrustful, we're disenchanted, we're disengaged. We scoff at perceived conspiracy in everything from national politics to our local council incentives, from COVID precautions to vaccine rollouts, from corporate business to charity organisations. Even in our personal dealings with one another, we are sceptical of motives and suspicious of agendas. And look, in the days of royal commissions into institu institutional responses to child sexual abuse, into aged care and disability, neglect and safety, as well as the misconduct of banks and financial institutions. It's no wonder that there's a level of scepticism undergirding our society. As I was searching for a definition of um, cynicism, I came across these. Cynicism, it's an attitude characterised by general distrust of others an inclination to believe that people are motivated purely out of self-interest. It's fault-finding, a rejection of the need to be socially involved, a pessimism about the capacity of human beings to make correct ethical choices. Cynics believe that they are well-informed, that they know truth and that others are simply naive or gullible or deceived. Being a cynic is not about noticing weaknesses or areas of need and then rolling up your sleeves to get involved and make a difference. Rather, it's a wipe your hands and sit in disillusionment and then say, I told you so, sort of attitude. Cynicism gives us the luxury of being right without the responsibility of working for change. It gives us the pleasure of effortless superiority. Oscar Wilde said, a cynic knows the cost of everything and the value of nothing. John Tyson in his book, Beautiful Resistance, describes cynicism as an intentional blindness of the soul. The issue with cynicism is that it highlights our core values. It outwardly reveals the state of our heart and exposes our perception of the world around us. It's not based in truth, but in fear and discontentment, and it has a complete and utter focus on self. Self-preservation at all costs. It deeply affects relationships and crushes any form of vulnerability, hope or openness. And what's a little frightening is that cynicism breeds cynicism. It's a self-fulfilling habit. You have a, a cynical spirit, it's tricky to say, you have a cynical spirit that looks for fault in others. So you become disappointed which leads to discontentment, which grows that critical spirit. People who expect the worst are really good at finding it. And the problem with cynicism is that it hasn't just become normal in the culture around us, it's becoming a big part of church too. We're cynical of people who show genuine passion and enthusiasm. They're a bit over the top, right? I mean, it's only a really a matter of time before they get burnt out. We're cynical about God moving miraculously in our lives. 
because we've felt the pain of unanswered prayer. We're cynical about the possibility of things changing for the better because life is hard and there's seemingly endless barriers in the way. So instead of being a people with good news to share, news that can transform the world, we've become guarded and distracted and sceptical. We can become plagued by a lack of expectation and we dismiss the work of God in our lives. Our cynicism requires us to see others without the heart of God, without the possibility of redemption or renewal. It says, I'm giving up. That person lets me down all the time. The reach of grace ends here. The power to transform the hearts of those people ends here. The potential for God's spirit to move in this situation ends here. Cynicism is an enemy of the gospel because it robs the world of grace. In contrast, Jesus envisions a future that is marked by joy. To be filled with the fruit of God's spirit within us to the point of overflowing. Unlike cynicism, which has a complete focus on self, joy is grounded in looking outward, in looking beyond, of knowing and trusting that God reigns. Joy is an outpouring, a sense of freedom, a giving of ourselves, a recognition and celebration that it is God's work at hand. Think about times in your own lives when you've been filled with joy, when everything seems as it should be. Perhaps you have memories of small incidental moments of knowing God's utter peace and presence. Or perhaps you can recall grand celebrations, perhaps a breakthrough that resulted in deep deep joy. Can you recall that sense of rejoicing? Celebration is an expression of our gratitude to God for his blessing and favour. In Psalm 16, 9, 11 we read, Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. Nor will you let your faithful ones see decay. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. The Lord is our confidence. He is the way to life, a life that produces joy and eternal pleasures. And joy is not naive. It's not some gullible emotion that is fickle and fleeting. And it's not incompatible with suffering because joy fixes our hope on the eternal promises of God and sees Jesus himself as our joy. This is seen in our Bible reading today. Jesus went on to say, In a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me. At this, some of his disciples said to one another, what does he mean by saying, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? And because I am going to the Father, they kept asking, what does he mean by in a little while? We don't understand what he is saying. Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this, so he said to them, are you asking one another what I meant when I said, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? Very truly I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that the child is born into the world. So with you. 
Now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice. And no one will take away your joy. In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly, I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Firstly, we see Jesus explaining a time of separation. In a little while, you will see me no more, and then after a little while, you will see me. He's explaining that there will be pain in separation, an interval between departure and return. We see the confusion of the disciples. What does he mean? It's not how they pictured or imagined. We don't understand what he's saying. They have a narrow understanding of the overarching work and will of God. Jesus hears their questions and explains that they're going to experience pain, a grieving loss. You will weep and mourn. You will lament while the world rejoices. It will seem as though the enemy is winning. But Jesus asks the disciples to fix their hope on joy deferred. There will be pain and suffering now, but like the metaphor of childbirth, they will rejoice when reunited with Christ. And then they will, we will, experience a joy that lasts forever. The era of misunderstanding will be over and accurate perception will be ours. The revelation of Christ leads to joy and rejoicing. Through the death and resurrection of Jesus, we are asked to see the world through the joy-stained eyes of God. Yes, there's sin and suffering in our world, but God is dealing with the broken mess of our sin, not creating it. God is breaking into our hatred and violence and strife with hope and restoration. Our world is being unbent and unbroken even now by the power of the gospel and the coming kingdom of God. But how does our scepticism, our guarded faith and cynicism hinder all that Christ could be doing through us? The real question comes down to this. What do you think God is like? Our cynicism suspects the goodness of God is not real. It's the ultimate ploy of the devil to get us to question the goodness of God. Did he really say you will surely die? We withhold celebration and joy because we're waiting for something bad to happen. We sit in our doubt. Whereas joy and celebration involve two fundamental beliefs in the nature of God. Joy comes when you believe in the goodness and faithfulness of God and when you have hope and trust in the promises of God. Celebrating the goodness of God is a thread throughout scripture. It's a dominant theme throughout God's word. And the first illustration of this is in Genesis 1, the creation of the world. Throughout the creation story, God saw that it was good. In Job 11, no, Job 38, 4 to 7, we read, Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstones? While the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. The morning stars are singing and the angels shouted for joy. It's the soundtrack of creation, a heartbeat pulsing through the universe as God was creating. It is good. It is good. It is good. God's heart was in it and an enormous outflow of celebration surrounded it. Now the cynics amongst us are saying, yeah, but it got broken. And it did by the actions of people. 
But the creation story of Genesis is the blueprint of God's intention. It reveals his heart for all relationships, for humanity with earth, for humanity with one another, and for humanity with God. And despite the fall, throughout scripture, we can see how joy is deeply connected with God's saving acts. Just think of the story of Jesus' birth and what celebration surrounds that. Ultimately fulfilled in Revelation when Jesus returns. Can you imagine the day when you fall into the arms of Christ and all troubles and striving cease? What joy. Let's not fall into the trap of developing a cynical faith that sees the Bible starting in Genesis 3 with the fall and ending in God's judgment in Revelation 20 without anything in between. Let's not miss that the world was created good, that all people were created in the image of God, that there is a promise of renewal of all things, that redemption is a gift offered to all. Those who know joy are grounded in the sacred truth that there is a constant thread of right, goodness, love, mercy, blessing and grace that permeates the world. For every wound, there's a possibility of healing. For every lie, the revealing of truth. For every setback, a possibility of growth and strength. For every transgression, an invitation for forgiveness. God's love is tangible. It's powerful. It offers hope and transformation. It offers redemption. Let's look at the story of the prodigal son in Luke 15. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. The father is looking out. He's hoping. And when he sees his son, he's not filled with righteous judgment. He is filled with compassion. He doesn't stand in superiority, but he humbles himself, pulls up his tunic and runs to embrace his son. His behaviour demonstrates his heart. Although the son acknowledges his sin, the father is not focused on it. Instead, he calls his servants to prepare a feast. The celebration is an outward expression of the joy that he knows. It's a fitting response for an act of celebration. I don't know about you, but I confess that more often than not, I'm less like the father in that parable and more like the older brother. I play judge and I sit in a focus of self. I am righteous and cynical and it impacts my relationship with others and with God. I build protective walls of distrust around my heart. I question motives. I am wary and guarded. And it's not who I desire to be. For my cynicism, cynicism renders me useless to the work of God. When I sit in fear, Job tells me that the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to shun evil is understanding. In 2 Timothy I read, For God did not give me a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power. When I am overwhelmed by doubt, 
The Psalms tell me, for the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all, he's do- in all he does. When I sit in judgment of others, 1 Corinthians reads, Therefore judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait till the Lord comes. He will bring light to what is hidden in darkness and will expose the emotives of men's hearts. At that time, each will receive the praise from God. When I am overly cautious, the Psalms tell me God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. And when I have some warped sense that I am in control, I read in Revelation... On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I need to lift my eyes from me and rest them firmly on the good God I serve. A few weeks ago, Jeff spoke to us about becoming dead to ourselves and alive in Christ, being totally surrendered to him. Now that's who I want to be. Being cynical stops us from giving ourselves completely to God. It thwarts our relationship, our reliance and our trust in how God could work through us. We are plagued by a lack of expectancy that stops us being all that God intended Instead, we are wary of his spirit as he moves in us and in others. They're too over the top. That's too extreme. It's not politically correct. Our faith is watered down and we become lukewarm. God's presence in our lives is something to be celebrated, not simply tolerated. Celebration is godly defiance in a culture of doubt. Celebration is the outpouring of joy that recognises the goodness of God, trusting his faithfulness, relinquishing ourself and inviting his spirit to be alive and active in us so that we are thoroughly equipped for every good work. Just imagine how God could work through us personally and corporately if we renounced a spirit of cynicism and embraced a spirit of celebration. If we develop simple yet profound practices of acknowledging God's presence in our lives, if we lost our sense of self and acted on the promptings of his spirit within us, A few weeks ago, a friend here from church called me and I could hear the initial hesitancy in her voice. Ladine, this is a bit of a strange call. But I've been praying and I feel God's prompting. He wants me to organise a meeting between you and another lady I know. I was so comforted. I feel like God has placed something big on my heart which I've been praying about for some time and to have somebody outside of myself confirm God's involvement, that was so reassuring. Imagine the unleashing power of the spirit within us if we freely acknowledge God's presence in our lives, if we declared his strength and peace as he shapes and equips us, if we joyously celebrated him using us for his purpose. Imagine if we unashamedly shared that joy. What acts of salvation might we celebrate? In his book, Beautiful Resistance, John Tyson says, we often talk about spiritual disciplines being the key to our faith. But could it be that in our cynical world, the key is not the celebration of discipline, but the discipline of celebration, making sure we commit to celebrating the good God we serve. When we openly celebrate, 
We are bringing the glory of God into the brokenness of the world around us. We're representing the God we serve and offering tangible grace to the world. As Paul so beautifully wrote in Romans 15, May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace as you trust him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of his Holy Spirit. What were your three character traits that you used to describe yourself at the beginning of our sermon? Do they reflect the work of God in your life? Let's resist becoming tame. Let the celebration of God's goodness overflow from your life so that others might see the power of the Spirit at work in you. Let's be a people who resist the cynicism of the world around us. Let's spread the good news. Mm -hmm.